Good afternoon, good evening and good morning to everyone. Welcome to this webinar celebrating the launch of the Green Feeding Tool. I'm Honorary Associate Professor Julie Smith from the National Centre for Epidemiology and Population Health at the Australian National University. With colleagues in Bono from the ANU, we'll chair and manage the webinar tonight. The Green Feeding Tool was developed through a research partnership between Alive and Thrive and the ANU and puts the power of data in the hands of policymakers, advocates, environmentalists and climate change scientists. We're pleased to be supported by FHI Solutions who contributed funding for developing the tool and by our friends at the ANU Gender Institute, the ANU Climate Change Institute and breastfeeding NGOs including from Indonesia, India and the International Baby Food Action Network who are helping with dissemination. Tonight, we have expert speakers to focus on evaluating reductions in GH in greenhouse gas emissions and water use from increasing breastfeeding and reduced reliance on commercial milk formula. We're live streaming on YouTube and we're recording the webinar. Those who missed out on Zoom registration can watch via streaming or view the recording later. So please introduce yourself in the chat. Next slide, please. This meeting is hosted the Indigenous women working, birthing and breastfeeding on this country for tens of thousands of years. Animal milks were not available. Breastfeeding is part of our mammalian evolutionary adaptation and survival that has been badly disrupted by colonisation, industrialisation and globalisation. Eminent Australian historian Geoffrey Blaney has written about Indigenous Australians that a mother normally fed a child at the breast till the age of three or four. To abandon breastfeeding at an early age was risky. Undoubtedly, a long period of breastfeeding curbed the mortality of infants. Above all, the prolonged breastfeeding strongly reduced the mother's chances of becoming pregnant and so helped to space her births. And as the inspirational reproductive biologist, the late Professor Roger Short concluded, the modern decline of breastfeeding is a major tragedy for the overcrowded world. I would like us to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders past, present. And I'm now going to hand over to Roger Matheson. Roger is an international nutritionist with two decades of experience working in non-government organisations, the UN, academic institutions and the private sector. And at the ANT, he provides program and technical leadership, management and coordination of Alive and Thrive activities across East Asia Pacific. Over to you, Roger. Thank you, Julie. So uh, I just want to mention that we are looking forward to also hearing from the participants here today. Uh, and we are grateful for your support in sharing information uh, about the green feeding tool, but also the related presentations at the webinar today. So starting immediately, you can help with the dissemination and the uptake of the tool uh, by joining the conversation on social media. Uh, you can also use the social media kit prepared to get started. And my colleague and comm specialist, uh, Nung Hong Nguyen, is now sharing that in the chat box. Um, you can use the hashtag green feeding tool uh, in all your posts and also consider relevant hashtags such as the World Environment Day for a broader reach. Uh, feel free to tag us with the handles Alive and Thrive and Thrive Solutions and those uh, from the Australian National University uh, and partners here today. So back to you, Julie. Thank you, Roger. Uh, I will now introduce Andini Pramona. Andini is a research officer in the College of Health and Medicine at the Australian National University, and she's recently finished her PhD at the ANU. Using mixed methods, her PhD thesis examined the facilitators and barriers of breast, the baby-friendly hospital in Australia and Indonesia. Over to you, Andini. Thank you, Julie. Uh, it's a very exciting night that we are about to launch the green feeding tool. And I'm on the Ngunawal and Ngamri land tonight, and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owner of the land and pay my respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging. 
I'm excited to support this launch of the green feeding tool, and I'm sure we're all excited to see how this tool can be used by policymakers, as well as how it would provide more evidence to our advocacy work. I hope that it highlights more of the excellence of breastfeeding by showing that it's not only beneficial for health and the economy, but also for the environment. Today is the uh, World Environment Day with the theme of this year is beat plastic pollution. We all know that we have reduced plastic use by breastfeeding compared to that if you do formula feeding. This green feeding tool will complement other tools such as cost of not breastfeeding tool and mother's milk tool. And it definitely will provide us with more evidence to support and protect breastfeeding. For tonight's webinar, we'd love to hear who's here with us and where you're from. So please use the chat box to introduce yourself if you haven't already so. And if you have any questions during presentation, feel free to put that in the chat box too, and we'll collect the questions to be answered in the Q&A session. If there's any unanswered questions, we're hoping to put a frequently asked question document so we will be able to answer it there. To make this webinar enjoyable for everyone, we'd like to ask that the conversation in the chat keeps on track and on topic, and it remains respectful. The chat will be monitored and we reserve the right to remove anyone from the webinar. Please keep your microphone off during the presentation to reduce noise and distraction. Moving along to the program, we have a list of wonderful speakers tonight. A lot to get through, but we'll do our best to keep on time. First, we'll have the opening remarks by Professor Colin Butler, followed by presentations for expert speakers. We'll then have some users' perspective of the tool for, from various stakeholders, and finally, Q&A session, which will be facilitated by Tuan from the Alive and Thrive team. We hope you can stay until the end and enjoy the webinar. Thank you. I'll now hand over to jo Julie. Thank you, Andini. And um, I will now introduce uh, Professor Colin Butler, who's going to give the opening remarks. Colin is an honorary professor at the National Centre for Epidemiology and Population Health in Australia. And he's a member of the Scientific Advisory Committee of the Doctors for the Environment Australia. Colin Butler has been interested in global health since institute and academic career focusing on the interaction between inequality and sustainability mainly at the ANU. He's contributed to five international scientific assessments including the the IPCC usually defined as a self usually as a self-identified dissident. Um, I think I probably need to tell you he in 2014 he was arrested for protesting Australian coal exports. I will now hand over to Colin for the opening remarks. Thank you, Colin. Uh, thank you. Can can you hear me? Can can anyone hear me? Yes, yes, we oh, can. Oh, good. Yes. Um, yes. And it, it, look, it's great. It's terrific to be here. Um, wish I could meet you personally, but uh, at least this way it's possible. I'm holding here in my hand. I don't know if you can see it. I hope you can. It's a, it's a sharp metal stone. It, it's from the Palawa people. They, they're the, the native, the Tasmanian indigenous people who were here before uh, colonizers came. I found this in my garden, coincidentally, about a week ago. I, I've lived in this house on and off for 30 years. And over those 30 years, I found about 20 of these. So I'm, I'm, they're cutting tools. I'm very aware that I'm on someone else's land. So I'm starting this slide here. Um, many of you will have heard the term neoliberalism. And if you're as old as me, you remember that when it came in, they actually claimed that freeing of markets would trickle down and, and reduce inequality and give us give everyone a better deal. And one of the ways this would happen was because it'd be a so-called level playing field. This cartoon was from 1991 in Australia. And you can see there, they're saying it should be a good match because of the level playing field. And neoliberalism is what we're all up against. And uh, to me, it's, it's just a terrible dogma. Uh, there's us, you know, against the powerful, the formula industry or the fossil fuel industry or the coal mining industry and uh, so many other things. Uh, can I have the next slide? 
Ah, yes. And it's a great honor also to be following the footsteps of Marilyn Waring, um, who's a previous previous uh, speaker at the at these uh, these meetings that you have. And one of probably Marilyn's heroes and mine as well is Kenneth Folding from uh, the 1960s. One of his phrases being the economics of spaceship Earth, and he's he's the one credited with saying the only people who believe in perpetual economic uh, growth are madmen or economists. And I suggest maybe the UN, maybe the, the UN who, fr who framed the sustainable development goals. I don't want to be too cynical about that, but I, I also think some of them think that we've got an endless earth, even though they'll, some of the rhetoric suggests otherwise. Uh, Bolding was nominated for two Nobel Prizes. He, he should really have got the economics prize, but, but of course he didn't. Can I have the next slide? Uh, yes, well, I got this slide off the internet from uh, a website there. I haven't been able to find out uh, who created it, but, um, you know, eating the future. I'm afraid that's what so many of us, you know, mindlessly driving uh, four-wheel drives ar around and flying across, you know, the, the planet relentlessly, et cetera. Unfortunately, we're, we're eating the future for an adventure that will hurt ourselves, even, even those of us who are rich. Can I have that the next slide? So I've got three slides here from the Emirates. I don't wish to offend anyone uh, living in Dubai, but uh, it is, I believe, the, the siting for the next COP, the next conference of the parties, climate change meeting. And most of you will know that the Emirates in the Middle East is a very hot place. And here's a woman, this is um, shown only two weeks ago, frying an egg, just using the heat of the sun. No, no fossil fuel, no electricity. Can I have the next slide? But it, Dubai, of course, has its wealth on fossil fuels, and you can not only go there and fry an egg without uh, any electricity or gas, you can also go skiing. So it's completely artificial. Complete. Well, this would, be, this would kind of be great in a way. You can go to a hot place and go skiing artificially if, if it was actually could be done within the limits of the planet. And it, and it clearly isn't. And now the next slide. I think also these hills in Dubai are probably artificial where you can go on the slopes. And unfortunately, there's a dark side to, to Dubai and many parts of the world, you know, it's, in fact, I've already mentioned the Palawa people here in Tasmania, land, land that, my, that the ancestors took here. Well, in Dubai, there's an under, underpinning of quasi-slavery. Now this film, Later on, you might go and look at it. Um, it's about 15 minutes long. If you don't know the story, you know, it's, it's really egregious. Um, people get tricked coming from uh, South Asia in particular, but all over the, the global South, they come there and, and, and uh, they have their passports confiscated and it underpins everything. But, and it's, it's hidden to most tourists and it's hidden to most of the media, but it's, it's, it's a terrible thing. You know, we have a, a planet of inequality. And the next slide. So what's the United Nations doing about it? Well, they, they say that they're building a greener, fairer, and better world. And they, they can see that we face these big problems. But their solution, rather than redistribution, is to sort of keep on growing the economy somehow. Um, and, and perhaps through trickle down, it will, it will fix everything. I'm, I'm very skeptical of that, about that. I think um, building the economy bigger and bigger, it's kind of like blowing up a balloon, but it's okay to, to a point. Now the next slide. So uh, one of the sustainable development goals is for so-called sustainable economic growth. But this economic growth is, is defined uh, in the same way uh, as, it, as it always is. The, the ecological economists like... like uh, Marilyn Waring and, and Herman, Herman Daly um, and Balding, we're very much in the dissident minority camp. Where occasionally they'll give a bit of a nod, nod to us. So when, I think when the UN's talking about sustainable economic growth, they're meaning the bad form of economic growth with all the bads in it as well as, as, well as some goods. Um, and they just don't seem to be aware that this is... Uh, it's just not sustainable, even though they use the word sustainable, throw it around like, like candy at a party. Uh, now the, the next slide. Now this this came out, uh, you see there, May, you know, May 2023, just, just last month, uh, our common agenda. And they're talking there about uh, 
uh, progressing beyond gross domestic product. And Pushpam Kuma, who's uh, the chief ecological economist for the uh, UNEP, uh, he, he's doing a lot of good work in this area, but uh, with no offence to Pushpam, who I know known for a long time, I, I think that this is, is basically greenwash. Out of curiosity, I searched the other day for a podcast about gross domestic um, product from Davos, you know, the World Economic Forum. And I, and I listened to half an hour of them going on, Larry Summers and others, and their talk was completely oblivious to the fact that GNP, GDP, gross domestic product has, has problems. They, they completely buy into the paradigm of the, the old way of measuring it. And so I remain to be convinced that the UN and other powerful people are really taking this on board. I mean, I have heard, I, I can hit, hit, you know, Australia was going to do it 20 or 30 years ago or New Zealand, but I don't think it's got, it's getting, it's got nowhere enough purchase. But I did find in one of these, our common agenda reports, there was a mention of breastfeeding and it talked about um, using the, the time, uh, measuring the time to come some, some sort of estimate. But, but breastfeeding obviously has so many other um, good things, you know, better bonding between mother and child, better brain development, better immunity for the child, uh, reduce risk of um, a mother, especially in a poor setting, using dirty water and baby getting diarrhea and so on, as well as the carbon and ecological footprint things. If you, if you could calculate them properly, for the GNP, you would you would show that breastfeeding would contribute far far more than, than using formulas. But at the moment, the way we calculate progress and wealth, it's it's the other way around. And um, you know, people have been pointing this out for decades. And so I'm going to come towards the end here, and I want to say with this, if the next slide here, I think it might be my last slide, is about eroding the social license. And I don't know a lot about the green feeding tool, but I would say that it could be a very powerful instrument to erode the social, so-called social license. But when I was at university, which was a long time ago now, I remember going, going into the common room of the academics and I could hardly see across the room. It was full of cigarette smoke. You know, these are all professors. This is in the early eighties at medical school. Just, you, that's unthinkable today in a rich country like Australia. We have eroded the social license for tobacco smoking in many settings. We are slowly eroding the social license for coal, coal mining, very slowly, I must say. And uh, we have to erode the social license for the, the uncall it, for the, the free use of, of um, formula. I mean, there might be some women that have, have to do it. Um, I'm not saying it's got no place, but it has a much smaller place than what we cur currently have. So, I mean, I'm not the breastfeeding act activist, you are, but um, I think this tool can go a long way towards doing that. And that will have um, tremendous benefits, including for, for climate change. So I think that's about 10 minutes and, and I'll end there. But just to, again, uh, thank you all for this chance to speak. Thank you so much, Colin, for that broad ranging and provocative introduction to this webinar. Um, I think that's a great start. And um, we'll now move on to a presentation, which is jointly by Do Dr. Britta Butri Stadelman and Ms. Alison Linekar. Um, Bruta uh, is originally a facilitator of La Leche in France. Um, she's an IBCLC, a lactation consultant. She's feeding trends initiative in France for two reports, and the most recent in 2020. And Alison has been at IBFAN's Geneva Infant Feeding Association for many, many years. Uh, she was interested in the environment, created the IBFAN's Global Working Group on the Environment, and she's continued to work with IBFAN after her retirement from, from the Geneva Infant Feeding Association, and publishing on the negative environmental impact of formula feeding. And her work um, continues in, and has had influence in a number of spheres. So I'm going to invite Britta to, to speak um, briefly on um, the work that the NGOs have led in this area. Over to you, Britta. Thank you. Hello, everybody. So I'm speaking on behalf of Alison, who has, for family reasons, no possibility to join us today. 
Alison, as you heard already, she joined IPFAN as a coordinator of the working group on environment, climate and health. And IPFAN was working for over 30 years to attempt to raise awareness about, about breastfeeding and that breastfeeding not only protects the health of babies and their mothers, but also the health of our planet. So this very short presentation aims to two things, to explain the key lessons we have learned from our work at IPFAN and at GIFA, GIFA being the Geneva office of IPFAN, and to show how they underscore the vital importance of this new green feeding tool that is being launched today. So the green feeding climate action from birth, it's every journey starts with the first step. And the first step is breastfeeding. Breastfeeding as being the ecological and the health friendly best uh, food for baby. And it's an important start. And it's important to inform parents about this start because if formula is the starting point, it probably will not stop at this point. It will uh, lead to industrial foods, to ultra processed foods and the benefit of having this choice at the beginning makes people or makes parents aware of the importance of the choice of food for their baby. So breastfeeding generally leads to family feeding, to family foods, to locally grown um, basic foods. Next slide, please. So in infant formula is an ultra processed foods. We really have to be aware of that. And it has two major impacts. It has health impacts and it has an environmental impact. I all, only talk about the environmental aspect today. Also, we could talk a long while about health and um, we will come back on this point. So the environmental is on three levels. It's the impact on water. Water scarcity is now all over the world. Even in France, for instance, there are 20% of the territories, they lack of water. You imagine in France, so how it will be in other points of the world, and especially uh, the points of the world, the regions in the world uh, where the population is targeted by the uh, formula uh, marketing. So we have to keep in mind that water scarcity is a real big problem. Then the increase in waste and pollution and the accelerated loss of biodiversity because we have less land, land that is habitat for animals, insects, uh, birds, uh, mammals, and all other species. So this is a big, uh, a, a big issue, which is, um, uh, hardened and made more uh, tight by a uh, formula and their marketing. Please, next slide. So the environmental impact is really at every stage. We have the production stage, then the packaging, the transport, the use, the preparation of the formula, and then the elimination, the garbage. And this on every level, we have for instance, the production of the milk powder and then the production of the oils which are added to the formula, the proteins, the sugars, the so-called HMO, which is a false claim because they have nothing human uh, when they're in formula, the vitamins and all the rest. And then you have the packaging and for the packaging, you have the same um, uh, sort of leather of production. You have the production of the packaging, you have the transport of the packaging, you have the use and then the elimination. For the transport, same thing. You have uh, the, the cars you have to produce, then you have to deliver them, you use them, you eliminate them at a certain, certain point. So you see, it is this is creating a kind of web of interconnected uh, carbon footprint. So all of these elements are intertwined and create pollution and create water scarcity because behind every um, stage, we have a, 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 water, uh, a water use or a water uh, footprint that is not wishable if you don't analyze it. 
And now, next slide, please. I would um, come to the point where I show briefly how was the work, how it evolved chronologically at IPFAN and GIFA, and how we could uh, actually, we are happy that this new tool is developed. So in the beginning, in 1980, uh, 1980 uh, 89, uh, Alison was uh, an uh, writing an article on the breastfeeding ecology will love. And actually the lesson we learned from this first publication was we were concentrating on breastfeeding, on the ecological part of breastfeeding. But we have to go further. And that's great with the tool because the tool includes the assessment of both the positive effects of breastfeeding and the negative impacts of formal feeding. The next step was um, the uh, UN Conference on S Sustainability, the UN Summit at Rio. There we were aware that nobody outside of the breastfeeding movements was interested in breastfeeding as ecological uh, uh, gesture or ecological action. So um, the tool now our your our say our because we will adapt it uh, adopt it. So the tool really uh, provides uh, evidence and arguments to convince economists and uh, on the negative impact of. Uh, uh, not breastfeeding. Then came in 1970, the World Breastfeeding Week. That's where I personally got the first time aware of the ecological uh, impact of formal air. That was nature's way with a nice leaflet. Uh, all these uh, chronological information you will find on our website. I made a special entrance for the tool launch today, so you find all the links uh, to get the documents. One of the key documents for IPFAN was the 2014 launched formula for disaster, where we really entered into the thematic of ecological footprint of formula. This was uh, written by uh, Alison Linkar, by Arun Gupta, who is, I guess, present, and GP Dadic. So, this was a really a basic document. So the next step uh, was from 2008 on, 2008 on, we realized that even articles who were talking about the ecolog ecological uh, footprint were um, using outdated uh, statistics and old numbers. So we realized that we have to uh, do something more recent and to gather information, local information. So this is uh, uh, also a very strong point of the new tool that the use recent statistics and fill gaps in existing data. Now, uh, from 2016 uh, um, document, there we had a country um, uh, evaluation on the ecological footprint made by the BPNI, the um, India IPFAN network. And this also showed that we needed new tools and new data. So the tool today uses really data for every country. So it's applicable to every country on its own level and to have something for advocacy. Now I will go, won't go through the whole list. It's too long, but please feel free to go on the GIFA website and feel, feel free to contact me or Alison to get more into details. A last just a last important remark as we are talking about breastfeeding. Every time we link breastfeeding to the ecological uh, impact or to green feeding, we really have to be aware that it's not, it's a modest choice to breastfeed, but it's not on mother's shoulder alone to save the planet or to go along with her breastfeeding. She needs support. And that's one of the big um, issues of, of IPFAN. We really consider that 
the frame for um, support to mothers and the protection of breastfeeding is at the core of our action and will stay on the core for the next years. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Britta, and that shows the amazing contribution that NGO groups, and in particular the, the IPFAN network and the GIFA group, have made in this area over many, many decades. Persistence pays, eventually. So now I'm going to introduce Amy Weissman. Amy is the Deputy Regional Director and Technical Director for FHI 360 in the Asia Pacific Region Office in Thailand. Amy has more than 20 years of experience designing, implementing and evaluating public health policies and programs. And she's the Director of the, the, the Deputy Regional Director for the Asia, Asia Pacific Region. In this role, she sets strategic and technical directions to address development channels channel challenges related to the climate and health nexus. Amy, welcome and over to you. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak about the environmental footprint of the health sector. Uh, I think this builds really nicely on Britta's uh, discussion around the ecological footprint of breastfeeding and taking a step further back. Um, next, yeah, that one, thanks. So before I discuss the impact of the health sector on climate change, I would like to acknowledge that climate change is the greatest health threat of our time. The effects of climate change, including extreme heat, severe weather, and air pollution, have led to unprecedented changes. These effects are displacing populations and increasing morbidity and mortality, and really reversing decades of global development progress. This is particularly true for vulnerable and marginalized populations. An example of the impact of climate change can be seen in the rise of dengue fever in places like Nepal. Though typically a tropical disease, uh, wetter monsoons and higher temperatures have led to an increase in dengue in Kathmandu, situated at the foothills of the Himalayas. In addition to an increase in health harms, climate change also affects the health center health sector's ability to deliver safe quality of care. Such climate related disruptions and services strain the entire system affecting access to care and patient outcomes. Next please. In addition to the impact of climate on human health and health service delivery, the health sector is a major contributor to climate change. If the health sector were a country, it would be the fifth greatest emitter it's responsible for approximately 5% of global greenhouse gas emissions. The majority of these, about 70%, are from the global supply chain. Next, please. Yet, if we can reduce the carbon footprint of the health sector while also building more resilient healthcare systems able to respond to growing health threats, we would mitigate climate change and have a significant positive impact on healthcare delivery, health outcomes, and healthcare costs. This approach is called climate smart healthcare, which, is, which encompasses three main uh, pathways to change. The first, we need to decarbonize healthcare delivery, facilities, and operations. Second, we need to decarbonize the healthcare supply chain. And third, we need to accelerate decarbonization in the wider economy and society. Within these pathways are the seven recommended high impact actions that you can see on this slide. These are the actions that we must take to achieve a major reduction in health sector greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide, please. If we don't act, but continue as we are today, healthcare's uh, climate footprint will triple between now and 2050. But there's a way for the health sector in all countries to reduce emissions by more than 44 gigatons over 36 years and achieve zero emissions by 2050. The roadmap, as illustrated on this slide, defines the course. It guides wealthier countries, where health sectors are the most prominent climate polluters, to take the most rapid action to decarbonize. It also guides investments in low and middle income countries for moving towards zero emissions, by, for example, powering energy poor health facilities with renewable energy. Next slide, please.
uh, whoops, well, let me just wrap up by saying thank you that our planet is in crisis and the health sector is a major contributor. But there are actions that the health sector can take to achieve zero emissions and to better health for all of us. The time is now for the health sector to lead. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. And it's important for us to see the irony in the health sector being such an important contributor to these adverse environmental impacts and to climate change and those complex causation pathways. I'm now going to introduce Alma Castrion Davila, who is a senior campaigner with the Changing Markets Foundation. Alma's been working as a senior campaigner for the Changing Markets Foundation for almost two years and develops campaign strategies working with different stakeholders to deliver the change required. She was previously a campaigner for the World Wildlife Fund. Al Alma is passionate about her work and enjoys living by the coast. So Alma, welcome. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate being in this panel today and um, sharing the presentation with others. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, for the past year at Changing Markets, we have been calling out corporate greenwash through our greenwash.com website. And last year we covered the fashion and plastic sectors. And in March of this year, we launched the food food section of our website with over 50 examples of products, projects, and advertisements that contain some of some form of green claims. This came from the back of a year long market research to explore green claims on food products, in particular, those coming from the meat and dairy, as they have a larger climate impact compared to other food products. Next slide, please. In our research, we noticed some trends for these claims. The most prevalent uh, were climate claims such as carbon neutral, climate positive, and net zero. Other more subtle claims uh, were those found in food products depicting happy animals in far family farms or bucolic images of animals grazing in natural spaces. We go into more detail on these trends in our briefing, Feeding Us Greenwash, that we launched alongside the examples of misleading claims in the food sector on our greenwash.com website. Next slide, please. So to give you a taste, I'll go over three examples that are connected to the conversations today around uh, baby formula or baby uh, food, uh, but more examples on food on other food products, uh, projects and advertisements can be found on our website. It is important to know that all of the examples in our website were assessed against the green claims principles from the UK Competition and Markets Authority. Next slide, please. The first on the list is Heinz by Nature. And the range of baby and toddler food uses the idea of nature and natural food as their branding. In reality, these products contain high quantities of both meat and dairy, which are key drivers of climate emissions, deforestation, and biodiversity loss. This subtle greenwashing plays to the marketing approach um, of presenting meat and dairy as a core element to a natural diet and as in harmony with nature. None of the ingredients listed are, are labeled as organic or carry any other sustainability labels, which suggests that all the by nature claims merely means that the ingredients are not artificial. Next slide, please. Um, so even organic products can have dodgy claims, and that's an example uh, like this one on Holy Bio and follow on milk sold in Germany that claims to be climate positive. The company claimed they have achieved this by reducing emissions and offsetting unavoidable emissions. However, they provide no information on how much they have reduced emissions by. They simply share a colorful diagram of some ways they've reduced emissions from parts of their supply chain. For their offsetting, Holly uses a combination of reducing emissions within their own supply chain, 
through soil improvement at two farms and carbon credits for a forest protection project in Zimbabwe. We could not find any information on the carbon credits claim from funding this project and how it compares to the emissions in their supply chains. Holly uh, may have some environmental credentials by being organic, bio, but to claim a dairy product is climate positive can be quite misleading. It's important to note that our research found there is a significant uh, greenwashing happening within dairy products, including carbon neutral claims that mainly refer to the, their packaging and ignore the bulk of emissions from the main product. Other dairy products also contains unsubstantiated terms like planet friendly or sustainable future along with images of cows in rolling hills. And that's an example that we're showing right now um, with the company uh, Arla, which is one of the largest dairy companies in the world with huge associated emissions. Um, one of our research showed that they have 18.9 million tons of CO2 equivalent emissions per year. And they claim neutrality on a key product simply by reducing emissions as much as, as, much as possible and then offsetting or compensating them. Um, Arla disclosed that this range of milk that we see on the pictures from cow to consumer emits about 123,000 tons of CO2 emissions. And then they will now fund projects that they claim absorb no less than the same amount of CO2 resulting in total emissions of zero. However, the company does not disclose um, these projects or provide evidence on emissions reductions. For their plan to reduce emissions, Arla plans to change the biological processes involved in dairy production. So in order to reduce their climate impact and that upsetting is a temporary solution uh, to provide, but they don't provide any readable Incredibly as available information about progress toward the, towards this goal. Um, this claim by Arla uh, was banned in, in a Swedish court ruling in early 2023, and they have since removed references to the product from their site, but no retraction or correction has been issued by the company to show they understand the claim that um, that, that claim was misleading. So why is it important to call out these misleading claims? Next slide, please. Um, with more people concerned about the environment, we see more people making purchasing decisions depending on whether a product is ethical or not. And as part of our research, we also surveyed people across the UK and Germany to try to understand their perceptions of food products with some form of green label. Some of the key findings were, Almost half of people uh, surveyed regu regularly choose food products with environmental sustainability labels or certifications. These consumers are interested in sustainable purchasing options, and one in three are willing to pay more for climate and animal welfare labels. Next slide, please. And people are influenced by mo the most common claims found through our research. So in the UK, 42% of consumers were more likely to buy a product with a carbon neutral label and 29% were willing to pay slightly or much more for those products. In Germany, the picture is much the same with 35% of consumers more likely to buy a meat or dairy product labeled carbon neutral and 36% more likely to buy meat or dairy labeled climate positive with 32 and 36 willing to pay more for this labels respectively. As you can see, there is a great opportunity for food companies to capitalize on people's environmental concerns through greenwashing without taking genuine positive action for the environment. Next slide, please. So it is important that regulators start taking a closer look at food products and companies that they regulate green claims and ensure rules are properly enforced across different markets. Next slide, please. The good news is that this is starting to happen. So public authorities in the EU, UK, and the US have key regulations coming up that will clamp down on some of these greenwashing claims. Overall, this will require companies to be more transparent and thorough before claiming any level of sustainability in their products. 
Next slide, please. And we're already seeing the effects of these regulations with companies like Mediterranean style fast food Leon quietly dropping down those claims. These new movements are a welcomed approach as it prevents consumers from being misled, provides a level playing field from a market point of view, and avoids this placebo effect where we believe that positive change is really happening. But overall, it is only a fantasy that these companies are feeding us. Thank you so much. So the chair of this webinar is also the next presenter. So let me step in to support. So first of all, thank you, Alma Castellón Davila, uh, for sharing this insight. Uh, and I really love the names of the reports, feeding us greenwashing and the play with words, uh, net zero integrity. Um, I would recommend that the audience take a closer look at this report, uh, which can be found on Changing Market Foundation's website. Uh, and it will for sure be a useful reference for us. Um, as mentioned, uh, Julie is the next presenter. So uh, I'm honored to introduce you to Dr. Julie Smith. Uh, she's an awarded Australian Research Council Future Fellow and Honorary Associate Professor at the National Center for Epidemiology and Population Health at the Australian National University. Uh, she's also a fellow uh, of the Tax and Transport Policy Institute uh, at the Crawford School of Public Policy, also at Australian National University. And previously, she held Australian Research Council and National Health and Medical Research Council funded appointments at the School of Regulation and Global Governance um, and Australian Center for Economic Research on Health. Her research focused on gender analysis, taxation policies, and economic aspects of breastfeeding. And she has more than 45 peer-reviewed articles, book chapters, and books. So a very productive <laughs> associate professor. Uh, she has been an expert advisor to the World Health Organization and the US Department of Health and Human Services, the Australian Department of Health, and the national and, and also national and international NGOs. Uh, she's a, a co-founder of the World Breastfeeding Trend Initiative in Australia and the former director of the Australian Breastfeeding Association. Previously, Julie was a senior economist in the Australian and New Zealand treasuries and the parliamentary research service in Canberra. Keywords for Julie's presentation today are climate change, breastfeeding and health, mitigation, adaptation and resilience. So over to you, Julie. Thank you, Roger. Um, next slide, please. Climate change disrupts food systems and exacerbates inequalities, but food systems and inequity also contribute to climate change. Infant and young child feeding illustrates these complex processes and feedback loops. In this presentation, I'll outline the state of knowledge on links between infant and young child feeding and climate ch change. This research underpinned the green feeding tool. First, I'll outline the historical trends in infant and young child feeding. In this graph, you can see the global commercial milk formula sales have been booming in the past decade and a half, driven by growth in low and middle income, alarming where it is halved. India is also facing huge challenges in the same area with rapid increases already in child obesity. The boom in formula sales follows a shift in the focus of company marketing efforts away from high income countries to middle income countries. Next slide, please. The rapid and dramatic collapse in breastfeeding in countries like China is similar to what happened in many countries like Australia, Norway and Singapore from the 1950s as childbirth became hospitalised and formula was heavily marketed in facilities and through health professionals. So the change that you see in this graph was due to structural factors, not because women's breasts had suddenly stopped functioning or because women chose not to breastfeed. As I showed in this, next slide please, in this economic historical research paper, less breastfeeding in Australia directly translated into more infant formula sales over the same period. Let's look at breastfeeding in the policy framework. 
using what are known as the three pillars of climate change response. The language of policymakers is mitigation, adaptation and resilience. This means approximately slowing global warming by reducing greenhouse gas emissions, learning to live with it, and being better prepared for climate change risks. In 2019, in the paper you can see here, I wrote about what this framework means for policies on infant and young child feeding. Next slide, please. This paper highlighted, as we've heard earlier, that it has been NGO action and advocacy rather than government or industry that led the return to breastfeeding in the 1960s and triggered research on the environmental impacts of milk formula since the 1990s. Over the past decade, there's growing recognition that our globalized and commercialized food system might seem cheap, but it generates large greenhouse gas emissions and costs for the planet as well as for health. Global warming is not just a coal and gas problem, it's also a food system problem. However, we've also seen that gully is an elderly flock and as erratically as a blind wombat heading for its burrow. Migration mitigation policies have come too slowly and maybe too late. Next slide, please. There are a range of environmental harms that arise during the life cycle of a milk formula product. These are identified in Alison Linekar's pathbreaking 2004 report and are estimated for babies zero to six months in this recent scientific paper led by Ellen Anderson. The environmental impacts include greenhouse gas emissions from manufacturing and use of formula products, remembering that food waste is high. Plastic waste from bottles, teats, packaging and so on is high. The amount of water needed to manufacture infant formula is also very high, being made from cow's milk or similar. A recent study by David Pope found water use is more than 5,000 litres per kilogram of powder over the product life cycle, mostly during the production stage, but also from sterilising feeding equipment and so on. Pounds of greenhouse gas equivalent emissions overall, about twice as high as was estimated for exclusive breastfeeding. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, that one's fine. These findings were in line with the 2019 study by Johan Carlson's team, which concluded that infant formula generated between 11, 8, 8 and 14 kilograms of greenhouse gas emissions. The green feeding tool uses data and on water and emissions from these scientific studies. Next slide, please. On most scenarios examined in the research, breastfeeding is highly mitigating. If additional food for the mother during lactation is needed and her diet is mainly plant-based, the carbon footprint of an extra human on the planet is minimized at less than two kilograms of greenhouse gas emissions during that first six months. Donor human milk, as Natalie Chinchenka has shown, generates high emissions per litre due to transportation to milk banks, but may facilitate later breastfeeding. Similarly, exclusive breast milk feeding using electric pumps may exceed daily emissions from formula. However, most mothers using donor milk or pumps don't use them for all feeds, for all days, and for all times of day for a whole six months. These examples highlight what we already know, that donor milk and breast pumps should always be considered a bridge to breastfeeding, not a replacement for it. At least two studies have considered the country level effect of infant and young child feeding practices. Karen Cadwell and colleagues examined the impact of all milk formula products sold in North America in 2016 and calculated emissions averaged about 59 kilograms of greenhouse gas um, emissions for per child aged zero to three years. The 2016 IPFAN report estimated the greenhouse gas emissions at country level for six countries in the Asia Pacific region. Australia, South Korea, China, Malaysia, India, and the Philippines. 
The impacts of declines in breastfeeding exclusivity and duration in these large countries such as China are large because of the great population and escalating use of milk formula products. Less than a third of the 15 million or so babies born each year in China are now exclusively breastfed. Around 660,000 tonnes of powdered milk formula are now sold in that country each year. Next slide, please. The IBFAN study highlighted the huge contribution of so-called growing up or follow-up baby milk products, as you can see in this graph. Around half the carbon footprint estimated for 2017 came from these growing up and follow-up baby milk products. Yet these products are stated by WHO to be unnecessary and potentially harmful to child nutrition and health. In fact, they cater to demand created by what the industry calls life pressures, such as mothers returning to employment, and by the supposed health marketing appeal to consumers. These rapidly expanding markets are, in effect, created for industry by government policies which fail to ensure that women have sufficient paid maternity leave access, that promote male use by disrupting breastfeeding. Next slide, please. I'm not going to say much about policies to assist living with climate change, adaptation. Climate change increases risk to food security, malnutrition, heat stress, and exposure to infectious diseases, as we heard in, about in Nepal. We also know that a population with high breastfeeding rates is better placed to adapt to these changes. Breastfeeding not only provides adaptive nutrition, fluids, and responsive care, but it also gives a baby strong immune responsivity and optimal organ development and lowers later life chronic disease risk and population level health burdens. Increasing dependence on commercial milk formula is a maladaptive response. Next slide, please. Resilience, being prepared for crisis. Children reliant on commercial milk formula are also more vulnerable to climate related crises like food supply disruptions, falling agricultural productivity, and rising food prices and effects of disaster. Reliant babies suffer particularly from food scarcity, lack of water, and electricity in these circumstances. Where breastfeeding is widely prevalent, communities and families can more easily prepare for maintaining optimal nutrition and health for infants and young children in crisis. Paradoxically though, unless there is deliberate emergency planning, preparedness and investments, breastfeeding can be less protected and supported during a crisis than in ordinary times. When governments do not step up industry grabs the marketing opportunities that arise in these terrible situations. The evidence from World Breastfeeding Trend Initiative assessments of country policies is that lack of planning for infant and young child feeding in emergencies and disasters is one of the most common failures of governments around the world in breastfeeding policies. These failures can result in less, form, less breastfeeding and more formula use in disaster affected communities such as we see during the Ukraine conflict, during the COVID-19 emergency, and amidst fire, floods and earthquakes, such as in Australia, New Zealand, China, Indonesia, and Syria. Next slide, please. Climate policy responses to infant and young child feeding issues highlight important social and gender equity issues. Next slide. Population growth is an important driver of climate change. An extra baby adds a lifetime of environmental impact, but especially so in high income countries. Because both industry and governments like to emphasise individual responsibility, feminists in this population debate raise concerns that women will be blamed or carry the guilt for climate change. This is a complex issue about fundamental human rights. I'll simply say that breastfeeding is well known to help with child spacing. But do women, especially the disadvantaged women, get equitable and adequate access to the necessary supports? We have individual responsibilities about our decisions as consumers, but the power for transformational change of systems, especially rests with government and industry. Transition to a more sustainable food system, 
first food system, breastfeeding, means reducing the could be relied on to achieve that. A 2022 study by Long, Aofi Long and her colleagues showed that achieving the global nutrition targets would reduce greenhouse gas emissions in countries like China many times more than introducing more energy efficient technologies in the Irish dairy industry. Furthermore, without appropriate regulation of baby milk marketing, companies can expand their markets so much by greenwashing that there is no overall progress in reducing carbon footprints. Again, NGOs lead the way in understanding the problem and pointing to the solutions. If Van's green feeding resources link data on countries' climate change contributions with the necessary breastfeeding policy actions. Next slide. Transformational change has costs and these burdens need to be equitably distributed. This means, for example, making sure that women are not blamed for having children or needing breast milk substitutes and are instead better enabled to breastfeed through system and facility level interventions like code implementation. And baby food to be very effective. Similarly, policies for paid maternity leave and, and regulations requiring equitable employment, wages and workplace policies can help increase breastfeeding and reduce, reduce reliance on infant formula or breast pumps. Mothers invest heavily in breastfeeding in many different ways, time, knowledge, skill, effort, money. From 2015, Ibfan's call for societal investments in breastfeeding was taken up by other global voices. The World Bank, emphasises that investing in breastfeeding is good economics. So if breastfeeding is a triple duty nutrition action with high environmental as well as economic returns, why so little change? A gender, gender budgeting framework helps understand this. The power and influence of the commercial milk formula industry is one reason. Who is in the room when policy is decided? The recent 2023 Lancet series paper three determines details how the baby food industry has used the tobacco industry playbook for marketing and advocacy to policymakers. We don't see change happening is that breastfeeding is largely invisible in economic statistics and other data used by policymakers. The green feeding tool will provide country level information on carbon and water footprints and has flexibility for assessments at different levels. It complements existing tools for calculating the economic value of breastfeeding, such as the mother's milk tool, and the economic cost to countries of low breastfeeding rates, the cost of not breastfeeding tool. The IVFAN's costing tool, the WBTI, helps define the investments needed. We hope this new green feeding tool can now support advocacy and decision making to generate effective action and greater investments. As our colleague Naveen Paudyal pointed out to us when we talked about the mother's milk tool last year, breastfeeding is so valuable and should be considered as a carbon offset. That is our next project. So I'm now going to introduce you to Alex Yelamo, who will take us through the, uh, the tool. Our child feeding specialist in development and emergency settings with extensive expertise in infant and young child feeding policies and practices, particularly in emergencies and on the international code and global tools. He's worked with UNICEF and WHO, particularly on the international code and has been involved in developing the World Breastfeeding Trends Initiative and IYCF policy tools with IBFAN in Asia. Got a very long CV, which I won't go through here, but I'll now hand over to Alex and he can give us a run through the, the way the tool functions. Over to you, Alex. Uh, thank you, Julie. Thank you so much. And thank you for organizing this uh, event. Let me also acknowledge the development team um, and while showing screen sharing the tool, but the development team is composed of Rene, Rosian, and myself. Rene and Rosian are uh, affiliated with Action for Economic Reform, and of course, Julie. Um, so this has been the dream team that for several months 
starting last year, 2022, work on the development of the green feeding tool. So let me give you, um, as Julie suggested, um, an overview of, uh, of the tool, um, hopefully a couple of scenarios that are will be the most likely the, the, the typical scenario that a user will be uh, confronted with. So you, you need to start, uh, this is, will be your entry page, and you will be selecting the country where you would like to um, start um, calculating your, your initial, your, your data. Let's use a country that uh, we may be familiar with, uh, or not all will be familiar with, but certainly some of our colleagues on the call, let's say Vietnam. And so for Vietnam, uh, Vietnam is one of those uh, countries that are listed in the tool where you have what we call preloaded breastfeeding information, preloaded data. And this is what the view is for each country where you will have, uh, where you have, sorry, preloaded information. These are information available through official sources. So in the case of Vietnam, we have mixed 2013, 2014 as available data. And the data are, as you can see, provided according to various age brackets, as well as total under six months for the total under six months. Um, Assuming the user is very happy with this information, with this available data, and no other modification, um, basically the user doesn't want to change the data, as I said, provided, or does not want at this stage to calculate is counterfactual, then uh, basically you are ready to go and you can already generate the expressing this, clicking on that uh, bottom, the carbon and water footprints, key, you can already generate the values related to, uh, let me magnify, to the range of carbon footprint for kilo of uh, commercial meat formula that is being consumed in the country. So you have a, from a low amount of CO2 to a high amount of CO2. So you have a range of carbon, of carbon dioxide being produced by the utilization of uh, commercial milk formula in the country, as well as the total amount of water, so the water footprint that is needed to produce and use that amount of formula in the country. So again, so this is a scenario one where you have uh, preloaded data, preloaded breastfeeding data, and you can just simply calculate again, the CO2 uh, produced by the amount of formula consumed in the country. And we are giving you a range from a low to a high um, um, amount, as well as the total amount of water being produced. Let's go now to, and, and of course you can save these values. You can print these values. Let me show you uh, in a PDF, let me go out. Uh, and then let's now look at another scenario. I'll go back to the country selection. And let's look at scenario where, let's keep it in uh, on, 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 uh, on, on, on Vietnam. Sorry. I think uh, uh, my system is frozen. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, I am currently in the field and my internet is not as good. Oops. Yeah. Let me restart. Apologies for this. I need to reshare it. Just a second, it's reopening. Uh, I got the, the document was freezing. Okay, let me reshare it. Hopefully it won't freeze anymore. 
So I'll give you another scenario uh, where uh, for Vietnam as well, just for to keep the same country, where I will assume the user uh, is uh, also happy about the baseline information already provided. But as you will see in the next cases, maybe the user would like to uh, project account uh, to, to, to project some counterfactual data with uh, projecting a scenario wherein, for example, uh, in the case of Vietnam, the counterfactual will be a, an overall improvement of the breastfeeding uh, situation. So what the user will be doing is to project this improvement based on several interventions that the user, the team, the national government is implementing. So what the user has to do is to enter the projected scenario that where the counterfactual that uh, would, will be based from. So assuming an improvement, a drastic improvement in the exclusive breastfeeding and predominant breastfeeding rates, uh, assuming um, that will be the main improvement and assuming some form of uh, uh, dec decrease of the uh, in decline in the partially breastfed and a drastic decline uh, in the use of formula. So you will continue after entering your projected scenario, in this case of a major improvement of the breastfeeding rates. So the user will be able to see the baseline information the counterfactual projections, uh, the user can save this information, can print this information. At the same time, and again, for the interest of time, we will not do it now, the user can, um, can select the contribution of maternal diet to the overall calculation of carbon and water footprints, either it's fully plant-based or a mixed plant and, I mean, and animal-based but in this case, let's let's not select it, but let's select just the carbon and water footprints in considering the counterfactuals that has been projected. So in the case of Vietnam, with those projections of counterfactual, you will see uh, two tables. One is the original table that is using the baseline information as you've seen earlier, and the counterfactual situation, assuming that major improvement in the exclusive breastfeeding overall the country, you will see a general uh, substantial reduction in the amount of CO2 produced, uh, the range, as well as the water footprint produced. And at the same time, obviously, and sorry for not emphasizing it, there is a major reduction in the loss, in the amount of lost breast milk due to not breastfeeding or due to mixed feed. So this is one uh, uh, one of the scenarios. So having available data and uh, establishing your uh, projecting your counterfactual, and now you can use the tool to do that. The uh, last scenario, very quickly. Um, let's let's go for a country again that is quite familiar for you uh, as many of our colleagues, sorry for the type, I need to type it correctly, yes. Let's look at Australia. So Australia is one of those countries for which um, for which, sorry, it's coming up. It's coming up. It's hopefully it won't freeze again, yeah. So uh, for which we don't have preloaded data. So Australia is one of those, mainly uh, this is a problem with the, our high income countries. We don't have preloaded information. There are no national surveys capturing this data for the under six months. So for any of those situations, for any of those countries where that you select, where there are no preloaded information, the user must, and I will, I'm sorry to use the term must, but the only way for the user to use the tool is to enter uh, his own or her own data. So the user must have some, some data that can be used for that context to generate the information. This could be survey data, this could be research data, this could be new in, in the future if ever Australia will capture the information in, in upcoming national surveys. 
So this could be those new uh, information that are coming out through publication. So, but again, without information, you need to enter your own data. So you select on data, uh, you continue, and then again, you enter, uh, again, let's create a scenario for Australia. These are, and this will be your baseline for the generation of the, of the values. So this is just pure invented information. So you can also change the, the light bursts. So let's say uh, there has been an increase in light bursts compared with the previous years. So you enter those information that will be your baseline. And uh, you press continue. It's uh, going to provide a small table with the data you have entered. Uh, we have not entered any counterfactual, but if you want, again, like what we did for Vietnam, you can enter your counterfactual. And the counterfactual in this case will be a counterfactual based on the new data that you have entered, the new baseline that you have entered. So in this case, you can generate the carbon and water footprints as we did earlier. But in this case, we have used a new set of data that we enter because Australia does as many other Unfortunately, as many other high-income countries do not have do not have um, uh, information on breastfeeding practices for infants less than six months, exclusive, partial uh, infant formula usage, etc. So this is the case using those proxy, those um, those invented, basically invented data. So let me close it like this. So again, in this case, you can save it, print it. And eventually, when you are done, if you are done with your generating your information, you can just exit the tool. So, uh, Julie, I think if we're in the interest of time, I'll give you back the floor. Thanks again for the opportunity to be here with you. Well, thanks again, Alex, uh, for being here tonight. I know you're in some dangerous place somewhere. And when Alex mentioned the dream team, Alex is the linchpin of that dream team. And I'm eternally grateful to him and Rose and Renee, and as well as the team the journey of developing this tool. So thank you, Alex. And I will now introduce another member of the wider green uh, dream team, um, Bindi Borg. Bindi's over 20 years of experience in humanitarian and development assistance with various international organisations in various countries, South and East, Southeast Asia, the Pacific, the Balkans, West Africa. Bindi's a certified breastfeeding counsellor and educator with 15 years of experience providing counselling in a variety of country settings. And she recently com com completed her PhD in public health nutrition at the University of Sydney. Currently, she's based in Kathmandu, but like Alex, she's on the move again. Um, welcome, Bindi, and we're looking forward to you as the first of our several users of the tool to give us a very quick introduction to how you've used it and played with it. Over to you. Thank you so much, Julie. And uh, I am really honoured and grateful and excited to be in the same Zoom room with so many people who've been thinking and working so long and so innovatively um, and from so many different angles about this fundamental issue of human and planetary health, and how they're linked specifically here through breastfeeding. I think it demonstrates that whatever sector we come from, whatever angle we come from, we all have a part to play. And I'm going to talk briefly about one way that we can play our part. So we, we know that uh, there are breastfeeding interventions that have proved effective and feasible in increasing exclusive breastfeeding and decreasing the use of commercial milk formula. So some of these are, for example, adopting and enforcing the International Code of Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes, the WHO Code, enacting paid maternity leave and workplace breastfeeding policies, uh, promoting the baby-friendly hospital initiative or 10 steps, and providing more and better breastfeeding counselling and information to mothers. So let's take a look at one of those, namely maternity leave, which Julie mentioned a couple of times. And 
we're really lucky to have an example uh, of uh, maternity leave uh, in Canada. So in 2008, Canada increased paid maternity leave from 25 weeks to 50 weeks. And the result was an increase in exclusive breastfeeding of somewhere between uh, 7.7 .7 to 9.1% percentage points, I'm sorry, which is a 40% increase in fact. Um, so if we take this example, we can make a really simple calculation. So we know how many infants were born in 2008. We know that before 2008, around 23% of um, babies were exclusively breastfed until six months. Uh, I'm sorry, I should say that was exclusive breastfeeding rate to six months. Um, and we know that after the increase in paid maternity leave, that figure increased to 31, almost 32%. So if we do the math, we can see uh, the number of, of children in either the before and after who are being exclusively breastfed. We can see, and, and we simplified for sure, we've made some simplifications um, because we only have exclusive breastfeeding right there. I've gone ahead and assumed that the other children were exclusively formula fed. It's simplistic, but it's a place to start. So using that uh, and knowing that every child that is exclusively formula fed uh, from zero to six months requires 21 kilos of commercial milk formula and knowing that each kilo of commercial milk formula uh, is responsible for somewhere between 11 and 14 kilograms of carbon dioxide. I've chosen to use the 14 kilos, so I'm giving the high end of the scale. So using, using those numbers and that data that we have, our simple calculation can show or suggest that paid maternity leave policy that was implemented in 2008 Canada reduced Canada's greenhouse gas, em gas emissions by over 9 million uh, uh, kilograms, the kilogram equivalent of carbon dioxide, simply by increasing exclusive breastfeeding. So for me, this is a really powerful example of, of how we can use the tool to see what difference we can make by increasing exclusive breastfeeding, not only to mothers and babies' health, but also to planetary health. Uh, and I would encourage you to use the tool in this way to imagine for yourself, if in our country or in our setting, we increased paid maternity leave or um, we adopted the WHO code or we provided more and better counselling to mothers and, and see what, what difference could we make to mothers and babies' health, but also to planetary health by reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So have fun playing with the tool. I certainly have. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mindy. Um, we also we have a number of people now to uh, other people to also comment on using the tool. And the next up is Alvia Hikmawati from Indonesia. Alvia is the head of the research division of the Indonesian Breastfeeding Mothers Association in the East Java branch. Alvia is the mother, she says, of two adorable children. We'd love to meet them. She holds public health and hospital administration degrees and joined the, the Indonesian Breastfeeding Mothers Association in 2015. Wanting to spread the joy and satisfaction of breastfeeding to, to more mothers, she took courses on breastfeeding counselling and works now as a breastfeeding counsellor at Soya Mother and Children's Hospital in Sidoarjo in Indonesia. Welcome, Alvia. Thank you, Julie. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Okay. Uh, I'll be speaking very briefly about Indonesia as a background. So for you who those uh, haven't understand what, where Indonesia is, 
we are located in Southeast Asia. Uh, we have a vast area and in archipelago. So we're separated in different islands. We have a huge population. So it was a big crunchy target for commercial marketing. So we have, uh, some of you might know it, we have uh, marketing involving medical staff and also uh, using mom influencer as well. And then this massive marketing uh, undermine mother's uh, ability. And it's, I know, unethical. So with this green feeding tools, I guess it will be very great to uh, give a protection. So we have already laws that protect and support breastfeeding, but in reality, we have a not so strong law enforcement. So with green feeding tool, I've tried it, thank you. I really wish that it could give a multiple approach. So from uh, individual like mothers and their families, and then for the mother, we could say, I don't know if it can say now, but at least if you want to uh, make your breastfeeding session longer month, then you already contribute to uh, lowering the greenhouse gases. And also, I wish that while the individual approach is being carried on, it also being advocated to the government. So I guess in Indonesia, like has been told earlier, we also want to reduce the emission. So if this could be a way to advocate government to protect and increase breastfeeding rate, I would be gladly to inform more people to do this. And last but not least, I really, really want these tools to work. So maybe in the future, it could be more user-friendly. Now we have to open Excel files. And I don't think um, mothers in here would be uh, able to open it anytime, anywhere. So when it, let's say like, uh, included an application when you have to click one thing and then the result comes out, it will be more interesting. I guess that's all for me myself. I guess these tools gives uh, environmental health literacy. That's all for now, thank you. Thank you so much, Alvia. And uh, that was a very interesting perspective from Indonesia. And we are appreciative of your um, your feedback, very much so. Now, I realised that I accidentally was confused by the program and um, we are now. Um, so, Andini, are you ready to present? I've already introduced Andini, but uh, I can say she's just recently finished a very fine thesis on the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative. So um, go go for it, Andini. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Julie. Can you hear me okay? Okay, okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity um, to share my experience in using this important tool. And when I asked to share my experiences using this tool, I think I would connect this to my PhD research, which focuses on baby-friendly hospital initiative in Australia and Indonesia. As we all know, the first few days after birth is very critical for breastfeeding journey. Therefore, uh, WHO launched the 10 steps to successful breastfeeding in 1989 and embedded it to PFHI 1991 to ensure mother have adequate information and support to initiate breastfeeding and maintain it even after discharge. There are lots of evidence that BFHI is associated with higher likelihood of breastfeeding initiation and duration, 
Unfortunately, the global uptake of PFHI is very low. Only 10% babies were born in a baby-friendly hospital. In Australia, only 26% of uh, hospital is accredited baby-friendly, while in Indonesia, only 8% of government hospitals was implementing the 10 steps. So I tried to make a simulation for two countries uh, that I also used for my PhD research. The first one is uh, Australia, thank you. As the baseline data is not available for this country as mentioned by Alex previously. So I used the data that is available from Australian National Infant Feeding Survey in two, uh, 2010 as baseline data. And then I also uh, put the counterfactual data in the scenario where there is no 10 steps or BFHI, then the breastfeeding rate decreases and extinct. We can, we can see the results here that the carbon and water footprints are high. And I also play around with the, my uh, second country uh, using Indonesia and the baseline data is available. So I just input the counterfactual data in the scenario the same as previously. When, where there is no 10 steps or PFHI, then the breastfeeding rate decreases and extinct. So you can see that in, uh, in the um, diagram there. These two scenarios are really terrible. So therefore I would emphasize the importance of investing in breastfeeding supports, especially in the first few days after birth. I also want to draw your attention to my social value calculation. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, these two uh, case studies has been, have been published in an uh, open access journals. Every one Australian dollar invested in maintaining BFHI accreditation in one hospital in Australia brings um, 55 Australian dollar or 37 US dollar of benefit, while every one US dollar invested in implementing the 10 steps in one hospital in Indonesia brings uh, brings 49 US dollar of benefit. So in conclusion, this green feeding tool, uh, we can show policymakers that breastfeeding is also beneficial, not only for mothers and babies health, but also for the economy and the environment. Thank you. Over to you, Julie. Thank you, Andini. It's amazingly interesting stuff, the economics, the environment, the health. Okay, we're now going over to Naveen from um, Nepal, Naveen Paudya, who is the Nutrition Officer for UNICEF in Kathmandu in Nepal. Naveen is Nutrition Officer at UNICEF and has 23 years work experience in the field of prevention and control of micronutrient deficiency um, programs in Nepal. His work focuses on country support to develop the evidence base for policies on prevention and control of micronutrient deficiencies using the multi-sectoral nutrition plan uh, platform and providing government counterpart to the design and implementation of proven interventions to reduce micronutrient deficiencies in Nepal. So over to you, Naveen. Naveen is a very important person in the history of the tool, as you will have seen and heard. Uh, thank you, Julie. Uh, uh, myself, so, Naveen Podal, uh, distinguished and all participants, participants uh, good morning and good evening uh, thank you for me inviting me to present on the use of green feeding tool for nutrition from nutrition prostrating and carbon offset this is very new area for nepal uh, as we see in nepal the exclusive breastfeeding rate among children is zero to five months has been declined from 66 percent in 2016 to 57 percent 2022 uh, as per the nepal demographic health survey uh, that means bottle feeding has been more than double, with an increase from 12 to 30 percent between 2016 and 2022. So, because of this increasing breastfeeding, uh, bottle feeding, uh, these results indicate there is a potential increase in carbon emission due to the increased use of formula milk and the dairy milk. And Nepal has experienced a lot of urbanization, migration, uh, and uh, with these urbanized migrations. Uh, the infant foods are reaching in the supermarket and the local markets. So on, in this regard, green feeding tool has a potential use for breastfeeding advocacy in Nepal. Uh, however, this tool alone may not be convinced to, to advocate, advocate for improved investment in breastfeeding, 
policies and programs in Nepal. That means we need to combine with other tools like mother's milk tool and cost of not breastfeeding tool. Uh, with a with a development of a, a comprehensive advocacy brief, which can, if we develop, that is part to multiple audiences within the government. That means uh, the environment minister of environment need also be in, uh, advocated. Other minister minister of agriculture and livestock also need to be advocated beyond the health. Be, the reason is after at, attending to this uh, webinar, I also realized. Uh, there is very less awareness in pan formula is also in ultra processed food and it has a health as well environmental impact. So after this webinar, surely we have been able to advocate more about exclusive breastfeeding and, and also uh, help government to understand these uh, mothers, these tools uh, benefit for the mother's health as well as the in planetary health. So, I'm highly grateful for inviting me in this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Naveen. Um, it's quite shocking to see what's happened so quickly in Nepal and disturbing what, what that means for the health and well-being of the population and the environment. Wow. Um, again, thank you, Naveen. Fantastic presentation. And I must say I'm ever grateful for people who make these presentations in a foreign language because I certainly couldn't do it. I tried once in Italy and uh, I really respect and admire people who can speak more than one language. Okay, now we're going to hear from Carol Bartle with the final um, presentation. Oh, yeah, for the final presentation this evening. Carol is an independent consultant and policy analyst in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Carol has a nursing, midwifery and lactation consultant background with a postgraduate diploma in child advocacy and a Masters of Health in Sciences, Masters of Health Sciences. Her research intensive and has worked on a number of major projects worked on a number of major projects, including development of the 10 steps in child, early childhood education. She's done a literature review for the business case for a, for a NICU milk bank, developed a community milk bank in Christchurch, which you may remember got has been badly shaken up by earthquakes and other nasty events. And she's also worked on projects related to prison mother baby units. Um, and she's interested also in infant and young child feeding and emergencies, the international code and marketing, and breastfeeding and infant feeding politics. Carol works as a policy analyst with the New Zealand College of Midwives, the Te Karate o Nga Kaiwaka Whanau Ki Aotearoa. Welcome, Carol. Thank you, Julie, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. Um, I'm going to start with um, a lens on the issues we face in Aotearoa and end with some green feeding optimism. So a 2023 report by Changing Markets, which has already been introduced by Alma earlier, um, found that Fonterra, who are a global dairy cooperative um, based in New Zealand, who export about 95% of their product, well, they were one of 14 meat and dairy companies actively greenwashing their products. So general industry tactics involve inaction, disguised as action, tricks and misdirections, and what I call dairy fairy stories, which I've put at the bottom. So what I mean by that is we get lots of promotional media releases about ingredients uh, that are going to be put into formula, which will replace breast milk or reproduce breast milk, which of course can never be. Um, next slide, please. Troy Basin, who is a professor of lake and freshwater sciences at the University of Otago, um, wrote in 2020 about the bleak news regarding freshwater ecosystems in New Zealand. So 95 to 99% of rivers running through urban and farming areas carry pollution above the water quality guidelines. Next slide, please. Next slide, thanks. Um, Dr. Mike Joy, who is an ecologist and senior researcher um, at Victoria University in Wellington, quantified the footprint of milk production in Canterbury, which is where I live. It's a region in the South Island with a lot of cows. Um, basically, as it says there, there are too many cows and too much fertilizer. 
next slide, please. I just want to put this slide in because I recommend if anyone can manage to watch it, the link is on there. Um, it draws attention to the flaws in industrial agriculture, but it also exposes the sustainability crisis. So it's well worth watching if you can get hold of it wherever you are in the world. Next slide, please. So there are a number of unsustainable footprints um, that need to be mitigated to reduce climate damage and reduce health risks in, in New Zealand. We have nitrate problems, um, we have E. coli issues. Um, we had really good water, particularly in Canterbury, we had um, excellent water, and now we have to have chlorinated water because of E. coli. We have an unsustainable dairy industry. And as Mike Joy has pointed out um, in the previous conversation article I put up there, to continue dairy production and have healthy water in Canterbury, we would need either 12 times more rainfall or a 12 fold reduction in cows. Um, next slide, thanks. I added this slide from a First Steps Nutrition, a recent First Steps Nutrition report, because I think it highlights the issues related to a lack of protection and support of breastfeeding. And it also illustrates how babies and children can be undervalued in our current system. And of course, it also draws attention to the inappropriate marketing um, by the baby food industry who misleads families into purchasing things that they don't really need to purchase. And now we have the cost of living crisis in many places. It's really having negative impacts and worrying implications um, for infants and young children. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Um, there's an inequity inherent in infant feeding decisions that needs addressing because we don't value women, babies or breastfeeding and the barriers to breastfeeding are often out of maternal control as has been highlighted um, numerous times by Professor Amy Brown. So media stories can and do deflect attention. So they deflect attention from industry and blame individuals when it comes to climate change. And also there's a blame that can frame, can be put onto women for not breastfeeding. So that media framing can mask the barriers that we know exist. Um, so we blame the women rather than the systems. Next slide, please. This is actually from an interesting recent publication from the Australian and New Zealand Formula Marketers Association, um, also known as the Infant Nutrition Council. I think what it really illustrates to me is not only the high use of commercial in milk formula, but also the success of marketing strategies. This was a, this was a survey, 974 parents were in the survey, and there was another 70 parents who were involved in online discussions or focus groups. 40% of these parents used toddler milk, and 56% of the parents believed that this was good nutrition. So I think it shows quite clearly that marketing is definitely working. So next slide, thank you. So now for um, mitigation and ad adaptation and resilience, I guess. So transformation, which is what we're looking at, changing everything about how we live. Uh, it requires a whole new way of thinking. It requires degrowth using less. It requires a reduction in damaging production and reducing dairy. Uh, in New Zealand in 1990, we had 3.5 million cows, and now we have 6.3 million, which is quite a lot. And um, the majority of those are probably grazing in areas where they shouldn't be grazing, um, hence the problem we have in Canterbury with all our rivers and our, and our water, our fresh water. So the focus needs to change to human and planetary well-being, as we know. And for me, I see hope in quite a few things, which is quite good. Um, we are about to re-establish a national breastfeeding committee or a national breastfeeding infant young child feeding committee in New Zealand after a number of years of not having one. And this, this committee will hopefully hold the line about the importance of exclusive breastfeeding and also the duration of breastfeeding. And also they will look at the collection of robust data because we haven't really got what I would consider to be robust data collection in New Zealand. We have good data from BFHI in our maternity facilities. And then after that, the latest data that I can get hold of only goes now up until three months. So we, I couldn't tell you how many women are still breastfeeding at one year in New Zealand at the moment. Also, of course, it's about the international code and it's about BFHI. We're very fortunate in New Zealand because um, it's part of the maternity services contract. 
to actually be a BFHI accredited maternity facility. So all of our maternity facilities are BFHI accredited. I think the other thing that the National Breastfeeding Infant Young Child Feeding Committee will be able to do now is um, not only introduce the World Breastfeeding Trends Initiative, but also another big reason for hope is that they will be able to introduce the mother's milk tool and also use the green, the green feeding tool, which is what we're here to celebrate today. So this tool will really help us to engage environmentalists and policymakers and governments to act on the increasing threats that we face in New Zealand. Misinformation and marketing needs to be addressed. And of course, the challenge here is to draw attention to more attention, because there's already attention on dairy, but more attention to dairy farming and water pollution. Um, I think the issue is there that drawing the attention to that to infant feeding. So I hope that the green feeding tool um, will now draw attention to the environmental importance of protecting and supporting breastfeeding and also climate action from birth. Thank you. That's me. Many thanks, Carol. That was a fantastic run through and overview. And um, especially important that it came from New Zealand, which like Australia is one of the major exporters of infant formula and especially the toddler milk and follow-up formulas in this region. Okay, well, we're now going to open up a brief um, Q&A session and Duan Nguyen is going to lead that session. Duan is the Regional Technical Advisor for Measurement, Learning and Evaluation with Alive and Thrive East Asia Pacific. He provides strategic leadership for monitoring learning and evaluation activities. Based on more than 30, 20 years of experience in conducting and supporting studies in 20 countries around the world. His research areas cover a wide range, maternal and child health, communicable and non-communicable diseases. So thank you, Duan. Duan has been the, the right-hand man in all this, another part of the big dream team. Really appreciate him. And he will now lead the Q&A session. Thank you, Duan. Yeah, so good afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Julie. And uh, uh, I could see that a lot of um, things happening in the chat. And uh, uh, that's very excellent questions. And um, we try to answer some of those questions. And uh, in the interest of time, uh, we will try to answer by email or question and answer. Um, have a, one of the very important questions that's uh, uh, from Leah uh, Richardson. Uh, who is asking why only carbon dioxide is good, but why not other uh, greenhouse gases? So probably I, I would like to maybe ask a direct question to Julie and the development team. Yeah, thank you very much. So thank you for that question. The measures that we're using are in greenhouse gas equivalent. So much of dairy products is measured in greenhouse gas equivalent. And so certain gases, as you obviously know, have a higher impact on the environment and on global warming than others. But all the numbers that we've quoted and the studies that have been done are all in a standard unit of greenhouse gas impact. So CO2 equivalent measures. Yeah, so thank you very much, uh, Julie. Uh, so in the interest of, of time, I would like to introduce back to Rosha, who will uh, have some closing remark and uh, put uh, like future direction. Over to you, Rosha. Yeah, thank you, Tuan. Uh, so thank you for joining us today from around the world uh, and for your interest in the green feeding tool. Uh, it's almost getting dark here in Norway, so I can think of <laughs> Australia being three hours later. Uh, it's probably way after dinner for you guys. So thank you also to all the presenters, to the testers of the tool and the co-organizers for your valuable insight uh, and your support uh, and for your important contributions to this World Environment Day conversation. I think tonight we will uh, look on social media and we will see that there's a lot of our conversation about breastfeeding, 
when we talk about World Environment Day, and I don't think that has been the case previously. Uh, some immediate next steps from the green feeding tool uh, include listening to your feedback uh, to further refine the tool. Uh, we plan to be quite effective and to share the updated offline version of the tool uh, with the recordings from the webinar within a week. Um, and also to answer the request from Alvia Hikmavati from IEMI East Java, yes, we are also working on an online and even more user-friendly uh, version of the tool. Uh, we plan to have this online version ready ahead of the United Nations Climate Change Conference, the COP28 in November. Uh, this conference is taking place in Dubai, as mentioned by Professor Colin Butler in his uh, introduction remarks. Um, if you go to the greenfeedingtool.org, you can also see a coming soon message there. Um, so we will try to get it out as soon as next month ahead of World Breastfeeding Week, but we at least we can promise ahead of COP28. Um, furthermore, we plan to publish a policy brief in a peer-reviewed international journal uh, describing the green feeding tool uh, and also the proposal of including proven country breastfeeding policies and programs uh, at suitable projects for funding as carbon offsets in the United uh, Nations programs. Um, as part of this work, we are also applying a feminist economic perspective that highlights the invisibility of unpaid work, including breastfeeding in economic and market-based studies. So we would like to connect with you if you are working on climate accounting schemes uh, or with the United Nations clean development mechanisms. Um, that might be a big ask. So uh, if you have any relevant connections as well, we would also be interested in that. So we could follow up on some of the recommendations to mentioned today. Finally, I would like to acknowledge all the mothers out there for your enormous contributions to the economy, to the society and to the environment. Uh, we really want to illuminate your efforts and celebrate your contributions to mitigate climate change with this event today and with the launch of the Green Feeding Tool. So thank you for your attention and thank you for joining the webinar.